Welcome today to Proverbs Through the Eyes of the Living Letters. Today, we're going to be continuing on when in Proverbs chapter 20, verses 16 through 20. I've uh, been rather excited about this, but I, I want to kind of correlate what we talked about last week with this week, because last week was was kind of a, a straightforward kind of uh, Proverbs that we were discussing. And this week is really no different. They're, they're the kind of Proverbs that when you read the, the Proverbs themselves, even in the English, it's relatively easy to understand because you can pick out what it is that the Proverbs are trying to say. Um, unlike some of the other Proverbs that can be rather enigmatic, they can have a, a puzzling sound to them. And depending upon the translation that you use, might make it a little more difficult to really fully understand what that particular proverb is saying. These are pretty easy to understand. So we're going to go over some very practical things in these, and we're going to look at some very deep stuff, because even within the Hebrew of these uh, of these particular verses that we're going over this week, there are some hidden things that I want to make sure that we bring out, because they connect with previous things that we've talked about. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys. So that way you guys can see the Passion Translation. And let's go ahead and get started. All right, verse 16 says this, Take the garment of a person who co-signs for a stranger, and if he co-signs for an alien woman, take collateral from him. Now, a lot of the, a lot of the older translations uses that term alien woman. In uh, the Passion Translations, Dr. Simon uses the word stranger. So... This is what he says in the Passion Translation. Anyone stupid enough to guarantee a loan for a stranger deserves to have his property held as security. Now, part of this comes up because of a law that's that's within the Old Testament that talks about if you give someone a loan, then, and especially if the loan is, depending upon, well, just food or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But usually loans are given because somebody's in a financial distress. And so the the person will come in and they'll take the garment. They'll take uh, some sort of security for that. The scripture is very clear that whenever that happens, that before sunset, before nighttime, to take that garment, even though it's being held as security, back to the one that you gave the uh, the loan to and it it part of that because because with with the heart of this father was instilling this place of recognizing how interconnected each one of us are and of course through the people of Israel and and the the trek that they took not only out of Mitzrayim or out of Egypt and all the way on through to the promised land itself and even into the promised land there was this place of connection and and there's multiple scriptures, hence the reason for the Jubilee, right? If if someone is taken in servitude, then at the end of the uh, of the the time of or at the end of that 49 years and the time of Jubilee, everything that that person had would be returned back to them. And the idea was that to not to try to take away the lands and the, the livelihoods of the other tribes. It was this place of equal honor. Now, the one thing that the scripture does allude to in the midst of all of that says that that's how you would treat a brother. But if you're talking about an alien or someone who's a stranger, someone who's not a, uh, well, in the case of the, the, the way that the law states, uh, that if they're not an, an Israelite or if they're not a not Jewish, then you would uh, you we could indeed begin to take security for a loan, and you could even charge interest. You know, because one of the laws say that you cannot change charge interest to your your brother as well. And so there's there there's specific things with regards to that, but the the what it does is begin to lay a foundation of the expectation of how we help one another out. There's a guy. There's a sage. He's one of the one of the probably the one of the most well known of the commentators and sages. Uh, his name is uh, Moses Maimonides, 
or it's his kind of endearing name, the one that many people call him, is Rambam, R-A-M-B-A-M, Rambam. I love that name anyway. I thought he was kind of cool, which uh, Rambam himself was was a rather unique uh, individual anyway, because he was actually Arab and had converted over to Judaism and became one of the most prolific of the commentators and the the ones who had, had begun to to help focus and shape a lot of the way that the Jewish religion or the Judaism is seen. And a lot of his a lot of his uh, interpretations are are good. I like listening to or I like looking at his particular interpretations as long as well as um, Rabag. Both of those are are two that I I like a lot, and uh, and so they're they're partly because of the heart behind the way that they interpreted the scriptures. It was very similar to the way that that I do. But when we when we look at scripture, of course, you know we we know that each one of us is going to see things just a little bit differently. There's nothing wrong with that. But and so. When you're studying scripture, find a, a a particular sage, if you will, that that you like that begins to describe the the Hebraic perspective of this. You know that's why they, we've got even in Christian, if, even in Christianity, we've got all kinds of different types of commentaries that are out there as a way of being able to to see things maybe from a little bit different of a perspective. But enough about that. I'm talking specifically about what this verse is talking about. So we realize that when there is a person who is a uh, who who is a, a brother, that we cannot take uh, and give them what's the word? My brain just went blank. You cannot charge them interest, and and the scripture does go in to say that if you do take something in security, make sure you give it back before the the night falls particularly because the scripture goes on to say that way that if that person prays at night saying, hey, this was taken from me as, as security and I don't have it back, and now they're freezing out in the middle of the of the street and that sort of thing, that's not good either. You're not going to want to do that with family, All right? So a lot of what we're going to be talking about in these four verses really deal with a lot of that place about what do we see and how do we see each other especially in the in the expression of of being family but the verse does say that it is okay that if you if you actually give a stranger a loan that that the one who has has given the money to that person for that loan that there is absolutely nothing wrong with taking the taking security for that loan particularly because you've co-signed for someone. You're not the one asking for the loan. You've co-signed along with someone who says they need the loan, and you're giving that up for security. And this scripture basically says it's okay to take collateral from them. Interesting thought process. Even though they may be, even though like if we're looking at this from the perspective of the law itself, even though they're they're, uh, uh, brothers, if the if the loan was given and co-signed by a Jewish brother to a stranger, then it was okay. And according to this verse, for them to take collateral as a result. But the whole idea comes down to this: King Solomon repeatedly in his play in his plight and plea of of beginning to to break down some of these these beautiful proverbs and teach the people of Israel that speaks about the recklessness of really guaranteeing the debts of someone else, particularly in strangers. If we talk about the place where we've been talking about with wisdom, you remember last week when we talked about the lips of wisdom, someone who's who's a wise person, then, and you begin to talk about someone who's now given security for a stranger that they don't know very well, get that, that they don't know very well, then it really does appear that that particular one who's given that loan lacks wisdom. You don't know the person. You don't know enough about them. You don't know their their hearts. You don't know if they're going to end up turning around and, and leaving and leaving you with the debt because when you co-sign the loan, that's exactly what happens. 
that you're 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 giving up out of out of that place. And so with just the heart of wanting to give and co-sign a loan for someone you don't know, it really begins to to show a lack of wisdom in that person. Remember that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. And lips of wisdom are a confirmation that the heart is full of wisdom. Well, if those two are true, then why would you ever guarantee a loan to someone that you don't know? Doesn't doesn't really make sense. See, the Torah prohibits the lender go from going to the house of the borrower in order to take an item as security. However, the lender may go to the house of the guarantor to take an item as security, even an item as necessary as a garment. Garments were spoken of a lot within the, the law, particularly because, again, garments were not only used for, for clothing, but in many cases, garments were also used for blankets and that sort of thing when you were when you were sleeping. And so they become necessary. The reason for this double standard is that it it is right to treat the borrower with special mercy if they're a person who is actually in need of that, because he probably borrowed only due to heavy financial presser, uh, pressure. But the guarantor, on the other hand, does not deserve the same kind of mercy. Now, this, this really gets a little bit interesting. I know from a Christian perspective, and the reason I brought up Moses Maimonides just a few minutes ago, um, kind of begins to speak about the place of mercy or chesed. In Hebrew, chesed is the Hebrew word for um, mercy, yes, but it's more, more translated loving kindness than it is even mercy. But uh, Moses Maimonides wrote a wrote a, uh, wrote up some stuff that talks about this thirteen attributes of mercy. Now, thirteen attributes of mercy are kind of a core foundation of of understanding. Now, I love these thirteen attributes of mercy because what what it begins to do is begins to explain the place of of the mercy of God. He also wrote another one where it talked about the giving of zedekah. Zedekah is the Hebrew word for giving of charity. And there are certain levels in in the giving of charity. The the most basic level, or if you will, the the lowest level amongst when, when when you're giving charity to someone, the lowest level is when you do it grudgingly. You, you go ahead and give it, but you really don't want to give it. And then it works its way up from that place of then to the place of where the best way of being able to give charity is to be able to give the charity. The, actually, the second to the highest is giving of a loan and to allow the person who's receiving the loan to be able to take that money and then do something with that. In other words, they can start their own business. They can begin to to get back into something where they're making money on their own and they're no longer dependent upon someone else in order to, to, to keep them going. One of the things that the scripture is very clear on is making sure that, that, that those that are around you aren't struggling. That if they are struggling, that, that there should be a place of, of when you should want to be able to give. Even sometimes when it hurts. I know I've I've done that. And and others have done that. And so the, there's 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 a part when when we know that that we can where we can help someone that we want to be able to do that. Well, the highest form of of giving that according to Moses Maimonides is that uh, is that the best way of being able to do it is to give where the receiver doesn't know who gave it, and the the person who gave it doesn't know who doesn't know who received it. So it's completely blind on both sides. That neither receiver nor the giver knows who received it or who gave it. And to be honest with you, that is the best way of being able to give because in the sense of that, think about it then no one can be thanked as a result, except Father, except the heart of Father. So when we, when we look at this, 
this particular scripture begins to to open up that place of really checking our hearts with regards to wisdom and the way that we see things. You know, notice that this doesn't say in the place of, of giving. It is talking about that place of co-signing alone with someone else. Now, I remember back when I was a kid, my dad used to tell me that all the time. He said, never, ever co-sign alone. And uh, be honest with you, my dad never co-signed alone with me. I had to work to that place of where uh, I was able to to handle it on my own, and I was the one responsible for it. So my father never co-signed alone with me either. So the idea behind this is, is basically taking prudence in financial matters, being prudent in the way that you see things. Don't stop giving when someone some sometimes when something is presented and and someone is telling you that they're they're having a difficult time, you know, even if it's if even if it if to you it doesn't seem like it's much, and and maybe you don't even have the ability to be able to give very much, but you do have a little bit that you can give towards someone else. Everything helps with regards to that place of giving because you don't know. How that, how that can help that other person and where they can take that same amount of money and be blessed and multiplied when they go to purchase food or that sort of things. Now, I know with me, I'm, I'm rather careful if, again, if it's somebody that I don't know. You know, if, I, if somebody walks up to me in the middle of the street and I, I can and they're asking me for money, more than likely I'm going to say no. Unless I hear Holy Spirit say something very, very specifically. I remember one time I was in, uh, I think I was in Missouri. Uh, I think I was in Missouri when it happened. And I pulled up to this Burger King. It was in St. Louis. And uh, I was gra- going to grab some of the eat. There was this guy sitting over to the right-hand side that uh, you could tell was obviously hungry. Had a little bucket there and was asking for, for money. But he never said anything to me as I walked by. But I saw him. And the Holy Spirit placed on my heart to go in. And so what I did was I ended up buying him food. I bought him a couple of hamburgers or a couple of cheeseburgers and a drink and some French fries. And then as I was going back out, I handed him the food because, again, he was obviously hungry. I didn't feel right in being able to give him money, but I I felt perfectly fine in being able to give him food because his little sign said that he was hungry. And I could tell just, again, this was Holy Spirit that that spoke. There are times that sometimes I walk past that. Is that wrong? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. All I can tell you is that that through the wisdom of God, just listen to Holy Spirit uh, with regards to that when when you're walking up to people you don't know. But this verse is specifically talking about co-signing for loans. Part of the reason that you need to be careful with this, these are some very practical things, you know, that, that we're talking about here. And that's why that's why I kind of forewarned you that, that, that a lot of what we're talking about today is very practical ways of seeing things. But if you think about when you're guaranteeing a loan for someone you don't know, then are you prioritizing or are you making sure that you're taking care of yourself as well? Because you got to remember that whenever you whenever you're co-signing for someone, that uh, that you don't know, there is a chance that you can lose that money. And so it has to be something where that it's okay that if you lose it, or it's okay that actually in that place of where they take off, you can just sit back and say, you know what? I gave it to you. I'm going to release you and forgive you of that debt. And and so be it. But it, it doesn't need to be something where it's going to be hurting you financially as well. But this also begins to to speak about the place of boundaries and boundaries in relationships. Now, again, when we look at it from the place of someone we know and we know well, I've I have people even now. I've, I told I told somebody this morning. I said, "Man, if I had a million bucks, I'd give it to you right now. No no questions asked. Boom, here it's it's yours." And. Uh, but that's because I know them and I know them well and uh, love them, love the family and and hate to see some of the difficulties of the things that, that they're going through. But 
just like I was talking about just a moment ago, when you're walking up to to people that you don't know or walking up to people like at a at a Burger King or in a mall or that sort of thing, there are some boundaries that have to be set because sometimes there's the person that you're walking up to has nefarious reasons as to why they're doing that. You open up your your purse or your wallet and begin to hand them money and they begin to notice that there's a lot more money in there than what you're handing them. Suddenly now you've got somebody who's trying to to rob you or that sort of thing. And so I, I, I it's 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 funny that we're talking about this in in this class, especially with the way that we we normally see things. But this is a this is this is talking about wisdom. This is talking about the place of the lips of wisdom. That is the reason why Holy Spirit is such so important. That place of of the spirit of the fear of the Lord and Holy Spirit as we hear Him in the things that we're supposed to do, and if we need to set up certain boundaries with regards to even even acts of kindness or generosity there should be boundaries with within that place that makes sense y'all a little different i've done this feels almost a little funny because I've, I've not taught quite this way before but we've got to look at these things since we've been talking so heavily about wisdom and wisdom within our financial uh perspective as well so let's continue on verse 17 says this the bread of falsehood is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth will be filled with gravel. In the uh, Passion Translations, Dr. Simmons writes, What you obtain dishonestly may seem sweet at first, but sooner or later you're going to live to regret it. If, funny enough, if you were to look at this from the perspective of the previous verse, then it kind of begins to make a little bit of sense. It They begin to kind of sum up the place of what is the cost, right? What really is the cost? Hence the reason why in verse 16, we're talking about no, not co-signing. What is the cost to you? What is it going to cost you overall? If you've got the money that you're able to do that and, and be able to give it away, even if, they, if it was set up to be a loan, it's not going to hurt. But when we look at verse 17, it also begins to speak about the place of, of trying to gain something, say it be through falsehood or or that sort of thing, to where to where, you know, we're looking at it from the perspective of maybe the stranger in this case, kind of, sort of, kind of makes sense, where their heart is to set up a falsehood. Their heart is to to be able to steal that money from you. They have no no uh, um, thoughts of trying to, to repay. Elsa, did you have something? I was just going to say what you just said. <laughs> about yeah. stealing something that don't belong to you. And then it stays really sweet at first, like you're eating a sweet bread or a sweet roll. And then later on, you regret it. And then it becomes really, really bitter in your mouth. Yeah. And it's like, and then you regret it. And then you're like, why did I do that? Right. But you just said everything I was going to say. <laughs> no, it's, that's good. That's good because you you added another aspect to it that I wasn't really thinking about at that moment. But you're absolutely right because if you're looking at it from that perspective of the person who is taking that, who is setting up a falsehood, they're going to be very sweet to you at first. They're, oh, thank you so much. You know that you know you're just the most awesome person in the world, and. You know, they're all of all of a sudden it's all of these 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 niceties and these things that they're 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 trying to encourage you and they're they're giving you all these compliments and that sort of thing. And and that may seem sweet at first, but then afterwards, when suddenly they come in and you've already given them far more than you could afford to be able to give them, now your mouth is filled with gravel because you're 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 looking at it from that perspective of like like what you just said, Elsa. Why in the world did I just do that? Right. And it's and it's funny. One of the uh, one of the one of the commentaries, uh, particularly it's in the uh, I believe it's in the midrash, but it's the Perke Avos. It says this: Calculate the reward of a sin against its loss. 
Let me repeat that again. Calculate the reward of a sin against its loss. And it goes back to exactly what, what I was talking about and exactly what Elsa was, was bringing up as well. And that's that place of, is this too much? Am I trying to give too much? Is this something that where it's gonna where it's gonna hurt me and cause a lot of pain for me? Because then afterwards I may get very angry with regards to that person because now I've put myself in a place of of lack because of giving. Hmm. I know in my own life that that I have done that before. I've I've given sometimes in the place of of where I was I was really trying hard to be able to give to someone, although it was someone that I knew, and and uh, it ended up coming back and and biting me, uh, particularly because I didn't have enough wisdom at that particular time, and I was in a sense almost trying to. Strong arm God. Strong arm God by giving. Now, is there anything, you know, anytime you give, is that wrong? No. But I have to stop and think about my own ulterior motives. Am I trying to say, well, I'm God, I'm giving like this, and I'm giving to where it hurts. So I need you to give back to me. Although the scripture does tell us that he will do that. But I'm trying to put his hand, put his arm behind his back, and say, "Hey, it's time for you to do this now." Elsa, come on up. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, that's just like, um, you know, without asking, you know, like you just said too, you know, because I, you said about same thing I was going to say, but you know, instead of seeking God first, because I wrote it down, like seek God first in everything before you do it, because you go ahead and do it on your own. No. God, you know, and then you're going to regret it. Goes, why didn't I seek God first? Because now, I, because I didn't seek Him. You're acting foolish because you didn't ask God for advice. You went ahead and did it on your own, and then all of a sudden it's like, all of a sudden you're feeling guilty about something because you didn't ask God's advice, God's wisdom. You know, because it says to ask God for, you know, ask God for all things, you know, for wisdom and knowledge and understanding to make you sure you're doing what he wants you to do and not doing it out of your own selfishness. Like, you know, that's how I'm going to put it. It might not be the right word, but anyways, like you're saying, okay, I'm just going to do it. But then afterwards you're going to say, I didn't ask God, should I have done that? Or should I have not done that? Always ask God first before right. you go ahead and do it because you might be saying, well, you know, because that guy can turn on you, you know, mm -hmm. and say, well, you know, um, I'm not quite sure how I really want to put this. But it's like they're just grabbing from you then. You know, they said, well, hey, we'll just go keep grabbing from him because he just gave it. And, you know, and then all of a sudden they just want more and more from you because you didn't ask the wisdom of God to give you, well you know, to give you that advice and wisdom to do what, you well know, said. because we didn't, we, we, like you said, we, we tied God behind us. You right. know, we've tied his hands without asking for his wisdom and knowledge and understanding of that. God, did I do this right? Did I, did I not? And then you repent of it because you're like, I should have asked you, God, I'm sorry I didn't go to you first. That's right. You know, That's to right. ask for your wisdom. But well, I just wanted to ask. Yeah, no, well said, Elsa. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit anyway, in that place of of the gaining of wisdom and and in the place of where we're we're talking about right now. Uh, but the same is true on the other side, because the same thing is true where, where you know, if, if I'm the one who is, is, if you will, trying to set up something to where, huh, where maybe it's a business or maybe it's a business idea, maybe it's any number of things, but where I'm tricking people into giving them money for something that's really not worth anything, or I'm, I'm trying to to gain a lot of money and that, that, that falsehood can fly, can fall on me too, as well as the other person that we're talking about here. And so this, this verse really begins to, to express exactly what you just said, Elsa. And that's that place of in the heart of where we love the Lord, our God with all of our heart, soul, and strength, then we're going to want to go to him first. We're going to want to go and get godly counsel with regards to things so that, uh, so that we we have the counsel of being able to understand 
what is going on with regards to something and then make our decisions based on that. We still may go ahead and do it, but at least then we have the we're armed with the understanding of of the fact that we've had some counsel with this and we know the pitfalls that could happen as uh, a result. And so the heart behind this is really the place of integrity, that place of wisdom and integrity. You know, there are two key things that to me both hold the place of the, of true wisdom. And that is wisdom and understanding and truth. Truth supersedes everything else because truth was in the beginning and truth will remain in the completion or the finishing of something. And throughout that, in the place of the heart of integrity and truth, then that's the place of where, where Father is going to be able to fulfill us. And, and it's going to be through honest efforts and not through that place of, of falsehoods. Bread gained through hard work and honesty brings genuine satisfaction. Unlike deceitful gains where, where you're trying to just get, get money. And I hate to say it, but we see a lot of that even nowadays with the fact that, that the economy is the way that it is within the world and the things that we're dealing with as a whole. And I'm not going to get into any more than what I just said, uh, cause I don't want to get political in here with regards to this, but this verse to me really kind of speaks of a lot of, a lot of things that we, we see nowadays. There's a part of me, though, that in the heart of this, that the way that I'm I'm talking about it right now sets up a place of fear. Right? You there's an opportunity for fear. Because every time you turn around, you're like, well, should I or shouldn't I? That kind of thing. Well, if you guys remember back when I had talked about this quite some time ago now, I talked about this old rickety bridge that goes over this vast gorge. And Yeshua is on the other side of that old rickety bridge. And he's beckoning you to come across the, the bridge. But when you look at the bridge itself, it's, it's nothing more than wooden slats uh, hanging with rope. And we're talking about thousand yards away you know, a long distance away. So much so that as you look out towards the center of the gorge, the 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 bridge itself is swaying in the wind because it's 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 so windy out there and the bridge is so light, it almost seems like why in the world would I even try to cross over that bridge? But if you remember the story, and if if you haven't, I'm going to retell just a part of it. The first thing that we do is usually before we step onto anything, we'll reach out and we'll grab onto uh, a rope. And in this case, this bridge, it has the wooden slats that are just wide enough for your foot to be able to put one foot at a time and one foot in front of another. And then there are two ropes that allow you to be able to steady yourself as you're going across the bridge itself. Usually the first thing that you do is you'll grab a hold of one of those ropes but in this case, this rope has a name, and it's called trust. So the first thing we do is we reach out in trust. And then with trust, we step out onto the slats of the wood on the bridge. Those slats of wood are called faith. Trust begins the process. But then faith is where we begin to make the move. We can trust all we want, but unless we begin to make a move, we'll never go anywhere. And so the moment that we do that, then, and we recognize, oh, wait a minute, I'm able to stand on this wooden slat, and I didn't think it could handle me, so let me reach out my other hand, and I'm going to grab the other rope. That other rope has a name, and it's called confidence. Because the first time that I trusted, and I reached out and grabbed the rope, stepped out on faith, I now have the confidence to take my second step because my first step held me. You see what I'm saying? And so I begin to walk slowly across the bridge, stepping out on faith and holding on to the place of trust and confidence. Now imagine that we've gone about halfway through uh, through this, this, this bridge 
and we're right in the very center that we saw swaying earlier. And sure enough, the wind starts to pick back up again, and it begins to sway. Do you believe that in the case of where just possibly, if you ended up getting knocked off of that bridge, that Father would teach you how to fly to be able to land right back on the bridge of exactly where you you left off? Why? Because you stepped out on faith, and faith will carry you. Even even if it carry even if it even if you fall off, it will carry you and bring you back to the place of where you are. But let's say you don't. Let's say you continue to walk, or let's say you do and you land back on the bridge and you continue your path across the bridge. At the finishing of that, when you reach the other side and you're sitting there and you're rejoicing with Yeshua and you're 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 happy because you've made he called you to do this and your trust is now in the place of where you trust the Lord more than you ever have before. You've walked out on faith and you know what faith is beginning to really say that that God has already provided everything that you already need, just like he provided the slats for you to be able to walk on and the ropes to be able to hold on to. And you have the confidence now because you stepped out on trust and faith. And so you're sitting there and you're rejoicing with, with, with Yeshua. And then he says, I want you to go back across the bridge. There's something else that I want you to see right back where you came from. Will you go back across the bridge? And I've often asked the question with this story when I tell that, how fast will you walk back across the bridge the second time because you were able to navigate it the first time? I'll guarantee you it probably would be at least twice as fast as it took you going over the first time. Why? Because now you're beaming with confidence. You understand that that bridge can hold you and that trust and confidence are now built up into you into that place of moving forward. So, you know, when when we look at this, I'm, I know you're like, well, wait a minute, how's this for a bit with verse 17? Well, we're talking about truth. We're talking about the place of, of where when we're standing on truth and faith is truth. Faith is truth to me. Does that make sense? Faith is truth. Now, I know that from a Christian Western mindset, we've had some different ideas behind what faith really is. And and I, I, I'm remembering, and I'll move on from here in just a moment. I remember when the Lord began to really show me what faith really was and what faith really is. And it changed my life forever because I always thought that if the faith was as a grain of a mustard seed, then uh, obviously I needed more faith. Because if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then I needed to spend time in study. I need to spend time with Father. I need to spend time in my relationship with him. Because again, it's not reading the Bible. It's not about going to church. It's not about all of those other things. It's about a relationship for sure, without a doubt. But yet, in the same breath, part of that relationship is growing and learning about, about him and, and who I am as well in the middle of all of that. And I remember when the Lord connected that mustard seed of faith to what the Scripture also tells me in that, that he has given each one of us a measure of faith. That's what the Scripture says. He's given each one of us a measure of faith. In other words, he's given each one of us a mustard seed. The problem was that I looked at the mustard seed and thought, well, that's too little. I need more than this to be able to do something with. Hence the reason why I would cry out for more mustard seeds. But then the Lord began to connect the mustard seed with the living letter Yod. And he reminded me that when Father began to speak creation into existence, he, if you will, he used a Yod and placed it into the middle of the expanse that he created to put creation into. And by the power of his words and the wind of his breath, he spoke to that yod and it began to expand. And it expanded to the point where it created everything in the cosmos, including our world and everything in it, including our galaxy and everything in it. And the, the, the cosmos itself of the things that we cannot see are all hid. We're all hidden within that one little tiny dot. And it hit me. Oh my God. Father, you've given me faith from the beginning, and I counted it as little or nothing. And you're trying to tell me, 
wait a minute, that one little measure of faith contained everything that I would ever need. And it was there from the beginning. So my questions are not, Father, I need more faith or I need more mustard seeds in order to be able to grow. Father, my question is then instead of begging for more mustard seeds, my question is, Father, what do I need to do today? What are the words that you called me to do for today? Because you've already given me everything that I need. And so the words that you want me to do today are the things that I can do today. And I know you're going to provide everything that I need to be able to accomplish that today. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Scripture goes on to tell us, why do you worry about tomorrow? So I know this, this verse seems kind of funny when we're, we're talking about falsehoods and how falsehoods can be sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth being filled with gravel. But what about the opposite side of that? When we're looking at the place of what Father has already given us, and then we're looking at that place of being a, a good steward of that and not trying to gain from falsehoods, not trying to gain from, from uh, something that's not true, but to hold true to the integrity of, of what he has given us and the truth behind what he has given us. And we'll never have to worry about verse 17 and our mouths being filled with gravel. That makes sense. So understand the consequences of your actions. Understand what can happen with what you do. Everything in the cosmos, everything in our world, all has a potential and an actual. There is cause and effect. Everything. Period. The law of cause and effect is one of the seven universal laws. There's nothing you can do to change that. That's the laws that God placed into existence that is that governs over everyone. And cause and effect are one of them. And so it reminds us, this, this whole teaching of what we're talking about reminds us to... Our actions carry long-term effects, whether we see them immediately or not. So in the place of practicing integrity, it saves us, it, it safeguards us from pain and regret later on. Make sense? It kind of reminds me, I, I, can't, I can't help but but bring up the story of Abraham. You know, when when we when we look at, at Abraham, Abraham heard the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord that he would have was that he would have a son. Well, in the middle of all of this, there was this gap of what, 25 years, 24 years between when he was told at 75 and when he actually began to have Isaac at 99 or 100 years old. So 24, 25 years old. And, and, and so the fulfillment of the, of the promise came some 25 years after the initial word was spoken. So right in the middle of all this, both of them, well, Sarah comes up with the idea of Hagar, and he gives Hagar to Abraham uh, to be able to, to, to have a son, thinking that maybe that was the way that the Lord wanted them to handle that. And, of course, we, we, we know the results of that because Hagar and Ishmael were not the ones that were meant to be where the promise would come through. But God said, I will give you a son. I will be able, I will be the one that 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 uh, that opens up Sarah's barren womb, and you will give birth to uh, a son, and and his his name was was Isaac. And so, as a result, I mean, basically, we have the beginnings of the Muslim and Arab nations with Ishmael, and we have the Jewish nation through Isaac. And if you recall the story, it goes on to say that once uh, Abraham, because of some issues that went on within the camp, um, uh, Sarah goes to Abraham and says, this, your, this son cannot have a part to play in everything uh, that, that is going on here. Isaac is who this, the, the promises needs to come through. And, and uh, uh, Abraham really didn't want to do that. He did not want, he loved Ishmael. But he heard a voice of the Lord that said, do it. You listen to Sarah. Listen to what she's telling you. And he kicked out Sarah and the and uh, excuse me. He kicked out Hagar and Ishmael along with that. 
And if you recall, the story goes where they go out into the the desert, and I'm not going to go through the the whole part of it, but an angel comes and he hears the cry of the boy. That's what the scripture says. He hears the cry of Ishmael, not the cry of Hagar, the cry of Ishmael, and begins to prophesy that he would be a great nation. And he went also, also on to prophesy that he would be at constant battle with his brothers. 5,000 years later, and what do we have still going on? We have the Arab nations, the Muslim nations, and the the Jewish nations that are in the middle of the battles that we even see even now. So there are long-term effects as a result of questions. So as a result of of, uh, actions that we do, and, you know, I get, I, I, to be honest with you, it's 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 funny. We we go back and we look at that story of Abraham, and it really begins to stir up a place in us of of recognizing. Wait a minute, how many times have we done that and and have disregarded maybe the way that we thought we disregarded wise advice and still ended up making choices. I mean, think about it. 25 years between a word. How many, how, how, I know I've, I struggle sometimes in that place of, of when father gives me a word and then the, and then the, the, the revealing of that word. Let's move on. I think you get the, the heart behind what I'm talking about. Verse 18, thoughts conceived in counsel will be firm and wage war with strategies. Now, this is similar to the one that we're going to be talking about. Well, this is the one I was talking about. Thoughts conceived in counsel will be firm and wage war with strategies. Now, Elsa, you mentioned earlier about that place of guidance and going in for 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 guidance with regards to something. You know, particularly in the place of of wisdom and when you're where sometimes we get wrapped up in things where even the wisest person must at times consult with others, you know, because sometimes we, we each one of us contain blind spots with regards to those matters which touch us personally. You know, think about it. Many times our families are blind spots to us, right? Mm-hmm. Our, uh, our close friends are, can, be, can be sometimes blind spots because of the connection and the and the the love that we have uh for them but taking time to gain counsel will be able to help us in in looking at all of those details to make sure that before we step out before we uh do anything we have to apply our own mind in that matter we have to stop and think about it all right so I'm not just going to come up to somebody and say, hey, I need advice with regards to this with re- without having taken the time to be able to answer all of the questions that I can see within my own self first. Right. Have you ever had somebody I know I've had people do that. I've, they've they've said, I need some advice. Well, what have you thought? What are your thoughts about, about this? Well, I don't know. I was just waiting for you to tell me. Well, to be honest with you, with me, that's that's a big red flag right there by itself. Because in some cases, somebody is coming up with nefarious reasons and saying, hey, I want you to help me with this. And or basically what they're saying is, I want you to tell me what to do in this case. In this case. But the idea is that if it fails, then now they can blame you and it's not their fault. Well, that's what you told me to do. You following me? You told me to go out and do that. I didn't. I, I, that was not my thoughts. Well, wait a minute. I asked you your thoughts and you told me nothing. So maybe there's wisdom even in the place of of where when we're going out and asking for advice as a wise person, the first thing that we need to do is us to spend some time with it. I love this because it fits even within the scripture itself. You know, when we're beginning to look into the the heart of, of scripture and that place of where we take time with it ourselves, that's the beautiful part about what we do in here that I love so much. 
you know, well, I know Fortune was tell, was saying earlier that, uh, and others, I know you guys have, have done the same thing, that you'll study this before we actually get to this. Well, that's perfect, because then you already have an idea of what we're going to be talking about. And it gives you an idea, but you may see things a little bit differently than the way that I'm going to teach them or say them. And that's fine, because when we get into the place of the engagement time, now we have the ability to be able to share that and be able to look at it from all the different perspectives. Well, isn't that the truth behind the heart of wisdom in where we can share with one another and be able to see those different perspectives, even if we're not specifically asking directly for advice, we're still learning from one another. Elsa, come on up. Yeah, I was just going to comment on that too, you know, um, because I did a lot of my own homework. Like you said, you know, I looked up in every, you know, in other scriptures, you know, in other Bibles, you know, those things, you know, out and everything. And what I got, okay, it says, you know, what I put down on my own, you know, it's like, um, if it doesn't feel right to you and you're seeking God about it, and you still don't feel right about it. And then what I put down is then don't do it. You know, if oh. it doesn't feel right, then don't do it. Even after you seek God about it and you don't have peace about it, you know, oh. God didn't give you that peace. Oh. And then you don't do it because then you're going to regret it afterwards. Well, go, said. okay, I didn't hear from God, but I went ahead and did what I shouldn't have done because I didn't have peace about it. Just like, you know, I'm going to put Sonia out there, okay? Just like when she was going to go to that meeting and she didn't have peace, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, her daughter had that dream and she sat straight up in bed and uh, she goes, mom, she goes, don't. And then Sonia later on got it too, because it wasn't the right timing. Right. And so she got God's wisdom on that. Yeah. And so if you don't have peace about it, then don't do it. Because even so, you know, if you go ahead and do it on your own, and then you're going to regret it because you didn't have peace. And he goes, uh, okay, God, why did I do that? Well, you know, it's not condemning anybody or anything. It's just that you need to really, really need to seek God on a lot, you know, almost everything that we do anymore, you yeah. know? And so I just, I just wanted to share that real quick. Thank you. Thank you. Boom. That, that, that is exactly right. Hata, come on up. Um. I, I just could have waited until you're in your discussion after you stop the recording, but I don't think I'll have the energy to be there. So I would like to share it now. Okay, go ahead. Um, while we're doing that, we're going to pray for you. Is that okay? It'll be yeah. on the recording. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, um, I was telling Daniel before the class started that between the stroke and the heart attack, they will be on a lot of drugs and I'm reacting and I had to stop the gabapentin because I had three witnesses. My daughter's co-worker said she couldn't take it. It caused her too much tiredness. He, the neurologist put me on it, but, but he said it'll help me sleep, but I'm having bad side effects. And then my another friend, her nephew said he couldn't take it either. And then a neighbor told me yeah, last night, it's not good for a lot of us people. So I got good advice from people that had reaction to it. Also, the blood thinner. He, they, they have me on two blood thinners, but I'm bleeding too easy. Yeah. And I'm scabbing over. And two, uh, the neurologist and another health doctor who I went to see said that I'm, I'm, I barely weigh 100 pounds. And two blood pressures a day. And so I got a good advice from the neurologist and the doctor who also believes more in natural things like vitamin B or vitamin D. Right. Both of them told me I only need one blood pressure a day. So my my problem has been and and this and the statin drugs make me bruise. And so that that first applied for me today, and I wanted to share it. Well, thank you, Hata. And I and and uh I'm I'm Thank you for allowing us to pray for you, even even though it's on the recording, uh, to pray for you with regards to this. But like I like I told you before, when we were talking about this, that always when it comes to the advice of of a medical professional, and it comes to you, there's a place of where Father has given us the peace. Elsa Elsa spoke it perfectly when she yes. when she mentioned that place of peace within her own heart, and peace really is the key. 
because sometimes I've prayed for things and or I've asked for things and or I've I've prayed with regards to a situation and I've not heard anything. The Lord doesn't specifically say anything in return or or anything like that. And I, I'm, I'm like, well, what do I do? And the one thing that I know that I can always rely on is the peace that's in my spirit, man. If I have peace in moving forward with it, then regardless of how it looks, I know that with all of my heart, soul, and strength, I stepped out on the peace that passes understanding, and then I'm walking on that, even if I don't directly hear a word. And so when when it comes to this, I want to make sure I, I, I let you know that you listen to the peace that's within you, and of course, the advice of your family and friends and those that that you honor and respect with regards to these decisions, because many times the doctors have reasons behind why they do that. But uh, I want to make sure that that you know it's 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 you're listening to your heart, you're listening to Holy Spirit, and you're following what you hear the Lord say to you. And so, Father, we bless you and thank you for Hata. We thank you. That, that looking at her right here and right now is a miracle in and of itself. Not only with the place of when we first met her, she had, she had had the stroke, Father, and seeing how she was engaging and talking. And, and there, was, there was, I know there were some, some uh, effects that occurred as a result of that. But Father, the heart behind Hata and, and the, the fact that she was sitting there was a miracle in and of itself. And then, of course, as we've gotten to know Hata and then the, the heart attack Took, uh, took place. And to still, Father, we thank you. We bless you that she is still here with us, even in the midst of, of these attacks against her body. And we thank you for, we bless, we pray your blessings upon her. Father, I declare Memhe Shin. Memhe Shin is one of the 72 names of God that specifically speaks about healing. The healing waters, the healing mem of the word of God as it begins to change us from the very DNA core level of ourselves, the hey, the framing, as that as the word of God is spoken over us, and as we speak in uh, resonance to what the Holy Spirit is saying, what we hear the Father saying, that it begins to frame that place of health and healing within our bodies. Father, the shin, the fire of God, the, the fire of your holiness, the fire of your purity that burns within Hatta, in the place of where she she's not only crying out in with regards to healing today, but the 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 heart of her crying out and the the fact that she's here and 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 able to engage with us in this place. We can't thank you enough for the absolute miraculous. If anybody wants to see a living miracle, look right now at Hatza because she is a living miracle just in the time that we've gotten to know her. So Father, we bless you and thank you for her. We thank you for that that in this place of where she is is walking through and deciding which medications she needs to take and which that she doesn't. Father, we pray your your wisdom upon her and the wisdom of those around her that are willing to walk with her with regards to to that. And uh that that in that place of those right decisions that father that 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 you are glorified in the midst of of all of that so we bless you hot and we thank you and we thank you for your continued healing in the name of yeshua thank you very much yes, but, but as i'm coming off the one drug i'll i won't be able to stay on for the discussion after that's fine that's fine I, understood still, my body's still trying to come off of that one cabapentin and yeah. so I will make it through the year five today, though. And you're, thank you all. You're I welcome. love you all also. And thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Elsa, for mentioning that earlier, because, again, peace is the key. And that's then and and Hata, that's what we're speaking over you is that the peace that passes all understanding in the in the process of what you and father are walking through with regards to this, that you hold on to that peace and don't let go. Uh, I remember I've talked about this before in some of my other of the other classes, and that's the place of of I know when the father started giving me his peace and I recognized how important it was. I began to to speak it this way. I said, I'm going to grab a hold of peace and and not let go, kind of like a bulldog at the end of a, of a bull's nose. I'm going to hold on, even even though I might be getting thrown around like crazy in the place of of where of the tenacity of what I'm trying to hold on to. 
but I'm still going to hold on to that peace and never let go of it. Just like the goodness of God. So, uh, the next step, we talked about the first step. First is in the place of, of, of your own thoughts. What you think, how, how do you think about it? Be prepared so that when you do go to someone else to be in, to, to ask advice, especially spiritual guidance and that sort of thing that you've already walked through it yourself. And you're not trying to, to, to do exactly what I was talking about earlier and have, and have a right to be able to blame other people. A lot of people, that's exactly what they'll do. And, and I've heard it. I've heard a lot of people in the church that will say that, well, God said this and the church said this and the pastor said this, and I've done all of that. But every time I've turned around and, and seen everything, nothing happened for me. All the things that they said were true were not true. No, they they are true. The words are indeed true. The question is maybe the way that we're seeing it. Maybe I was wanting to use that as a way of being able to stand back and say, well, it doesn't count for me. It doesn't work for me. Maybe maybe I'm disqualified. Now that's a whole nother that's a whole nother conversation. It's a whole nother ball game. But or I want to blame someone else and and say, well, it's their fault. It's not my fault. I did everything that I was supposed to do that was right. It was your fault because of what you said. So that speaks to us for those of us that are beginning to to learn the wisdom of God in that place of wisdom and, and how people can can do this. So the next step would be again, like I was saying, in consulting others and uh, to be able to air some of the things that are going on to see if maybe they come up with other possible options that could have been overlooked. It's the reason why we do our engagement time afterwards is because I'm only giving to you from my perspective. When we join together, we're looking at it from the, the, the full perspective. Now you add on top of that, because the second part of this verse goes on to say, uh, Thoughts conceived in counsel will be firm and wage war with strategies. Well, that part, wage war with strategies, begins to talk about, well, what if there's an enemy to contend with? What if there's somebody, there's an enemy, actual enemy to contend with? Now, I know a lot of times when I say that word, we immediately think about other people. Now, and that could be true, naysayers, someone who says, well, that can't be true for you, and blah, 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 and, and they're trying to pull you down and, and not allow you to, to begin to see things the way that you do that. Well, in that place, we have to deliberate with special care because there's the, the enemy himself is also deliberating and trying to figure out a way to stop you from the place of what it is that you're you're looking at. But, or from where you may be thinking about going or what you're thinking about doing or the, the expression of what the, I hope that, I hope that's making sense right there. The way I said that, I felt like I didn't articulate it quite well. And in the, and when it comes to naysayers and other, and other people who try to, to, to diminish us or to disregard our beliefs or our thoughts that, that, that they can be kind of like an enemy but what about the enemy within? We can't forget about the enemy within, too. Many times our own thoughts, our own ways of seeing things can also be like an enemy. And that's sometimes that enemy is harder to overcome than an external enemy because it's the way that we see ourselves. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that, that, that that's, that's one of the biggest things that for me, that I have had to deal with is the enemy within that place that I say, well, well, Father, who am I? Who am I in, in the midst of all of this for you to be able to do anything? So that, that, if you will, like the battle with the haters, the battle with the naysayers, the battle with, that's one, that's one aspect. And sometimes we even have a little bit of, of when it is a hater or when it is a naysayer, there's there's a place of confidence that kind of builds up in us in some cases because we realize ah they're just they're they're a hater they're there's someone who's who's trying to drag us down but when we're dealing with that evil inclination on the inside of us that tries to keep us our own selves from looking at it that's a harder harder battle 
to to fight. But both can be true. So in the practical application of this, seek advice before major decisions. Find someone you know and you love and and seek their advice. And, and, and even if you don't use it, you don't have to. But find someone that you honor and respect and you know has got you your best best interest at heart to be able to help them let it be a let it be someone who's um a pastor or someone who's just a very close friend dora i see your hand oh, thank you shalom i just wanted to ask a quick question with regards to what you said about um the example that you um gave for instance about um your thoughts and talking to the father that uh, who am I for you to yeah. do anything for me? I wanted to, to know how do you see or perceive um, humility, not uh, humility, hu humbleness. Uh, what would be uh, the truth humbleness that you would uh, Good question. Per perceive? That's a, that is a really, really, really good question because I know that for me, a lot of a lot of times when I thought about the place of humility, that those questions of like, well, who am I, are questions that a lot of times that we would equate with humility. But I still have to answer the same question of what do I see and how do I see it with regards to that question in the first place. In the heart of true humility then there's no question with regards to that. There's a place where we may say, well, who am I in the midst of all of this? And, and realizing that, that what we're seeing in front of us is so far grander than what we could have ever thought, dreamed, or imagined. And that place of where we're, we're standing in humility with regards to something. However, at the same breath, I know myself better than anybody. And so... There are times that when the same question comes up, my thoughts don't go to the place of the humility that you're speaking of from that perspective. And instead, it goes to the place of, well, who are you to 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 be standing in this place? Remember, you did this and you did this and you did this. Now I've got the accuser of the brethren who's throwing these things at me. And the accuser of the brethren is, is my own my own enemy within that is starting to bring up these things to, to degrade me, to keep me from doing those things. Two totally different ways of, of looking at it. Matter of fact, some would say that that second one is false humility. It's, it's, it's false humility. We're, we're humbling ourselves as a way of, of saying, well, see how humble I am? So the questions behind what we're talking about here are really only answers that you yourself can answer, Dora, and the heart behind what you're doing with regards to that. But it's a great question because it does mix together perfectly with humility in that place. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. I almost think that humility would be just the integral part of um, of somebody, I guess, of of son of sonship uh, of of. It um, is of sons and and so they wouldn't even have to really uh put another thought into it because i feel Fair that enough. humility is a term coined by humanity and not by god i feel as it as it is his nature um in a way but um sorry i it might be too difficult for me to grasp um this, this no no sentence. no no dora it it you you're nailing it uh, you know, I do know that the scripture tells us, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And so there's there's an expression behind that place of of humility. And truth be told, I don't know what the word Hebrew word for humility is right off the top of my head. So I need to look it up and, and see what it is just as a way of adding to this. And we'll do that in the uh, engagement time. Uh, but you're you're right. But in the same breath, I guess. I guess I have to look at my own life and I I can tell you that most days I'm like Lord I I can't I can't thank you enough for what you've done and who am I in the midst of all of this to see where you've placed me in the what you what you've done in and through through me in the midst of all of this but then there are times when I'm by myself when my own my own uh, enemy within comes out and starts starts on that whole 
aspect of it at the same time too. And, and so in the place of, as I've learned trust and confidence, and we talked about that earlier in the place of where I've, I've begun to walk out on faith and I'm trusting and having more confidence in him that when those thoughts arise, they're easier to push away now, but they're never absent. And that, I'm just talking about me, but for me, they, they're never absent. There's a, there's a, there's a place of that. There's a part of me at the same time, though, Dora, where I'm thankful for that. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but I'm thankful for that because then it reminds me about the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And in the place of the spirit of the fear of the Lord, then I'm like, okay, Father, thank you. I know I may still deal with this, and, it, and I, may, I may deal with this my entire life, but that's okay because I've learned to trust you and I've learned the place of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so thank you, spirit of the fear of the Lord in teaching me how to quickly and, and learn more quickly to push those thoughts away, knowing that father, you are leading me and guiding me into all truths. Holy spirit. You're the one that's taking me into the depths of me seeing the father and becoming what I behold in him. Does that make sense? So I I'm only saying, cause I deal with it. That's, that's, that good, Dora. So you're nailing it. You're 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 not you're not misunderstanding it. You're nailing it. Uh, and thank you because it does it does open up a, a beautiful aspect of that. Uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> as a matter of fact, one of the other practical takeaways from this is balancing confidence with humility. Proverbs a lot of times will warn against self reliance without consultation. In other words, relying only on ourselves without going out and, and gaining advice. True wisdom involves acknowledging that others' perspectives and advice can enhance our own understanding and help us make better choices. So there is a place of, of confidence and humility that has to maintain a balance. Hence the reason why I was saying what I did just a few moments ago about, about the fact of being thankful, because that helps that confidence, humility, balance to begin to balance itself out and being thankful about the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So, all right, very good. Let's continue on because we still got two more verses to go through. Verse 19, with a revealer of secrets, a bearer of tales or a simpleton of lips do not mingle. So this verse begins to now look at what we've been talking about, especially since we just got done talking about that place of, of, uh, of going out and, and getting spiritual guidance or advice or advice with regards to things. And that there's wisdom, you know, the, the scripture tells us in Proverbs, there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. This is the same, this is the basically the same verse in verse 18 that we were just getting over, where, where we're looking at it from the, the, a different perspective, but the same heart of it was still true. But this verse goes into the place of being careful with who we go and connect with. And, you know, this verse lists three different groups of people, revealers of secrets, the bearer of tales, or the simpleton of lips that we should not. Why? Listen to this. And this is what the Mishlei says, because they misuse the gift of speech. How often in here have I spoken about this place and encouraged over and over and over again how important our words really are, how the words that we speak have a power and authority that we never imagined that they ever had before. They always had. We just are now getting to the point of beginning to realize, wait, even the little things that I say have a power to them. As a matter of fact, in the Hebrew, it's known as the Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara literally means negative speech. And it it, it it talks about the place of that with our Lashon Hara, with this negative speech, that what we're doing is we're, we're impeding the very thing when we're speaking about good things by turning right back around and creating negative speech. Now, in this case, this verse really looks at that of being others. But again, even with this verse, I have to go back and think about if you can go there with me, the enemy with it. I don't like using that term because I don't want to, I don't want you to get the idea that that in the Father that that we have an enemy within. But yet 
in the same breath, that's the only set of terms that I can use right now that helps to make a little bit of sense. That part of us that 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 sometimes is the naysayer that thinks, well, who am I really? And that sort of thing. And that part of me can also be one that brings up negative speech. Now, through time, just like you said, Dora, uh, and, and, and thank you for, for bringing that out, because the truth is, as a son, as he moves into the place of, as Hatta and Elsa talked about, with the place of peace, and the peace that, that passes all understanding, the one thing that we know we can fall back on is the peace of God. And so, even if we don't hear anything, even if we're not sure exactly what the next step is supposed to be, if we're stepping out in that place of peace, then we're stepping out in that place of knowing that that Father gave us that peace, and He's allowing us to make the choice on our own. So, if we add on top of that negative speech, now we're adding in that place of where we're negating the very thing that we're talking about in the first place, the very positive things that we talk about in the in the first place. And so uh, both are true. I'm not. I don't want to hang around with someone who or talk and 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 go get very personal with someone who then is going to turn around and and begin to tell my secrets, bear bear tales of things that I've done or 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 that sort of thing. You know, or a simpleton of lips is someone who is unwise. That's basically what they're saying. And that that out of the abundance of their heart, their mouth speaks. And hence the reason why they're considered a simpleton, because their mouth is opening up and just revealing everything. May not be from a negative perspective. They're not trying to do anything. But all of a sudden, they just start going, blah, 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 not thinking of the consequences of what it is that they're saying. That's what a simpleton of lips is. All right? So... On a mystical level, on a deep level, speech is seen as a powerful force that can uplift or can harm other people and their souls. Words have energy and spiritual consequence that impacts both the speaker and the listener. Both. Think about it. How many times have we heard things and someone has told a tale about someone And suddenly, with that telling of that tale, something they should never have spoken, other people begin, or or you begin, or we begin to believe what it is that they said. We buy into the lie of what it is that they're talking about. And now, all of a sudden, we have a negative response or negative speech towards someone or something that we should have never had a negative thought with regards to. That's what the scripture talks about, that when he when he talks about the place of no no man after the flesh, but after the spirit. I know that's that's New Testament, but it's 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 perfect. No no man after the flesh, but after the spirit. And that's what we're talking about here. I know that I've been in situations where where in a place of where I felt like I was kind of getting in with the crowd so to speak, that that it felt kind of good when you were in the middle of that crowd and they were accepting you, but then they started to hear what the words that they were saying and then they were talking about everybody else and how they did this and they did that or blah, 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 and all this gossip and bull that, that goes on behind the, behind the scenes. And, you know, and of course then now because I've heard that, I have an opportunity now where I can continue to allow that gossip to continue in me and begin to spread the same lies that they were telling in the first place or the same speech or the same negative place of what they were trying to talk about. I can continue to spread that out and not do anything about it or a matter of fact, make it worse. And it, then it begins to harm me because now I'm the one responsible for the things that I say. And so, um, Elsa, come on up. Yeah, I just want to add real quick to that, Daniel, that, you know, when you talk about people like that, you know, and you're rumoring about, you know, spreading rumors about them, about that person or person, you know, it also ruins their character. You know, I mean, they're trying to destroy that person. And when they go out and all of a sudden all these other people are starting to talk about that person and this person doesn't know what's really been said. And then all of a sudden it ruins their character because then it's like, what did I do? What did I, you know? And so it ruins their character. You know, they try to ruin their character on that. That's right. You know, 
and it's really hurtful because they don't know, you know, because that person that they're talking about doesn't really understand on how much damage they already done to that person or that character in that person and puts them so far down that that person realizes that, you know, well, I don't know what I did. I don't know why they're talking about me like this. You right. know, and all of a sudden this person has a, you know, has this hurt feeling in them and they don't know why they have this hurt feeling in them exactly. because people are bad mouthing them so bad. You know, and spreading exactly. all these rumors about them, and then all of a sudden they're ruining this. And all they really want to do is ruin that person's character because this per- character has such a deep personal insight in themselves, and they're so and they're so giving and caring, and it makes the other people jealous. And so they talk about yeah. this person yeah. to ruin their character, and that's all. And to me, that's yeah. all they really want to do is ruin that person's character yeah. because this character has a caring and loving personality in them. And there, other people are so jealous of them that they say, "Well, hey, we'll just spread rumors on these per, on this person, right. and we're going to try to ruin their de- character." You know, right? That's right. And so I just wanted to bring that out because I got this from Thank another, you. you know, from an, another um, transcript that I got. That 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 is that is good, you know, because the the truth is is that uh, if you remember back a couple of weeks ago, we actually brought this up and and it talked about the place of negative speech towards someone else. And the truth is, is that, that that negative speech towards someone else can be seen as murder. Right. The hatred towards a brother can be seen as murder. because it, it And it is. Why? Because it's killing the character. It's killing that person. And but, but when negative speech is allowed to continue on, it doesn't hurt just the speaker. It hurts the listener and all of those who, who will also listen as a result of that. And so that's 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 really good, Elsa. It's exactly exactly right. And I know for me in the in the situation where I was talking about earlier, what ended up happening was as I began to notice that 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 these people these people were talking about other people so freely and and how stupid they were, or how bad they were, or blah 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 blah, whatever it was that they were saying, I was like, oh my god, what are they saying about me when I'm not there? And so when they started in that whole process, even though I kind of wanted to be a part of the group. When they started on that whole process, I would end up getting to the place of walking away because I was like, I don't want to hear this. And I don't want to start sharing something with someone else who's then going to take my words and bring them back to me and 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 focus their their energies towards me because I know who I am. And anyway, that that's there's, there's more to that story. I'll just I'll stop right there. So uh, this is good. Remember that that. When we're, we're doing this, and just like Elsa brought up, protect relationships, protect other people's reputations. Don't allow this place of us to go out and begin to speak negatively over someone else and, and cause them harm in the place of where it's killing their character. Again, according to Scripture, according to the Proverbs that we, heard, uh, that we, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, it's akin to murder. And seen in the spiritual perspective as murder itself. And so uh, cultivate that place of when we're we're speaking to one another in encouraging words. And if we need to, avoid the negative environments and that sort of thing. I told you guys, today was a very practical uh, way of, of doing things. It's been a very practical expression because of these verses have this practicality in our everyday life. And so I hope you guys are enjoying this, this perspective with some of these practical takeaways, you know, and and looking at them from, from that perspective. So let's be careful. Let's not be a revealer of secret, a bearer of tales, or a simpleton of lips, nor mingle with them and walk away from it. Verse 20, let's continue on. And we're going to wrap it up with this. I've been excited about getting to this one because it kind of takes the previous four verses and pulls them together in in really looking at the core of of the of the heart behind all of this verse 20 says this one who curses his father or mother his light will flicker out in the deepening darkness in verse 20 in the passion translation it says this If you despise your father or mother, your life will flicker out like a lamp, extinguished into the deepest darkness. Now, both of which I think are a perfect way of beginning to open up the door of of what this is talking about. We know that through the Ten Commandments, or 
I don't like, I don't really don't like using that term. Uh, the better word or the better way of saying that is the 10 words. Uh, uh, the Greek actually does a really good job of, of properly translating it, and they call it the Decalogue. Deca meaning 10 and log meaning the written word. And uh, so it's the 10 words. And out of these 10 words, one of those that was spoken was the place of honoring your father and your mother. So if we go back to, we talked about this a while ago, and I talked about the place of where the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord. You remember that? The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And so the light that we have on the inside of us is the light that Father has given us. Hence the reason why the scripture also talks about, well, why would you take a light and put a bushel over it? Remember that scripture in the New Testament? You're not going to take a light and put a bushel over it because then nobody in the house can be able to see the light that's there or it's diminished. It's greatly diminished. But it's funny, we, we know that scripture, but have we ever thought how we apply that? Because sometimes when we, when we do begin to do some of these things that we talked about in those previous four, four verses, or if we begin to curse our mother and father, it's just like putting a, a bushel over our candle. What we're doing is we're covering up that light in the inside of us in order to keep it from affecting us. Does that make sense? With the light of the Father on the inside of you, it's going to begin to look in every nook and cranny within our hearts. Well, sometimes when we're looking into every nook and cranny of our hearts, there's parts of our own hearts that we're like, oh, God, I don't want anybody to ever see that. I don't want anybody to ever to imagine that, that I've ever thought that or felt like that or did that or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we tend to kind of cover up that light. And it's funny, I don't want to get into it, to this in great depth, but if you think about it, the more that we do that, then we're covering up more and more of the light that's on the inside of us. That light was given to us by Father. It can't be taken away from us. It's been given to us by Father. But how is it that people can go to a place of where they do the heinous things that they do? And I asked that question of the Lord, and he kind of brought me, he brought me back to this, this example of what I'm talking about right, right here, and that place of putting the bushel over the candle of the, of the light that's on the inside of us. Well, if I continue to do that by my own lustly, my own lusts and my own desires, or if I do that because I've, I'm cursing my father and my mother, and I'm not honoring them, I've rejected them and pulled myself away from them. If I'm doing that because I, I don't want people to see that part of me, so I cover it up and hide that up and allow that light to be hidden, it brings me to the place of where can I, can can I, and, and this might seem a little controversial, and I hope we can get into the conversation about this in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, engagement time, but I don't think it does because it answers a question from a very enigmatic scripture that I always wondered about. In, uh, in the New Testament. and But if you follow out my picture here, we begin to cover ourselves and cover that light. But there's a place in the New Testament where it says, if the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? It makes sense to me now. Why? Because I've chosen to cover over the light. I have, I have, if you will, bound the light of God within my own darkness. Nothing can extinguish that light, but I, by my own flesh and desires, have covered that light. And now it makes sense. How great is that darkness? Because now there is no light on the inside of me, at least not that I can see, because I chose to cover up that light on the inside of my own heart. And it's funny because I've, I've also looked at that from the place of, well, then how can people do the heinous things that they do? Well, in the place of where I've done that, basically what I've done is I've created my own world where I'm the God of that world. And if you come into my world, then if I'm the God of the world, then I can do with you whatever I want to. I can do some of the heinous things that happen. That speaks a huge place about the 
the the this place of of honoring our father and our mother and about this light that is on the in inside of us you see the michelet goes on to say this that parents are the channel through which the divine light and life flows into the child let's break it down in its most simplest terms egg and seed or yeah egg and seed meet together within the place of the confines of 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 love and now a child is born as a result of the egg and seed coming together and so that child that was not before now is i've often said this we are most like god in that place of when we are making love in a husband and wife right and so if you can go there with me science has even proven this recently in the place of where when the egg and sperm meet then there is a flash of light that occurs they've been able to find this in animals and they believe the same thing is true and of course we believe that's to be true anyway because that's the light of the father that light of the soul the light of the candle of that life that is in there that was given to them by father in that moment of conception that light was the life that was talking about and it flowed through the place of not only father but the coming together of the husband and wife. It took more parts than just the father himself. It took the husband and wife coming together as well. And honoring them maintains this sacred connection. So what, I'm, what am I talking about here? Sometimes we forget easily, especially when it deals with family, that place of the connection of who we are as family. You know, I, I, this is really helping me because I, I've, I've, the Lord gave me a vision not too terribly long ago, and it's been very difficult for me to be able to articulate it, but I've, I've spoke about it as much as I possibly can. And that's the place of the real true picture of who we are as Echad, as one in the Father, right? As the body of Christ is what it says in the New Testament, right? And how that actually works together. If I realize how important you are in the connection of who I am within the body itself, then why in the world would I ever do anything to harm you or, or anything else? Why? Because I need you. You have a part that only you can play. And I, there is an equal honor in that, even as we deal with one another. How much more so with family? Because now it goes beyond just that place of just the spiritual aspect of it. Now we're going into the very connection within the, the, the flesh and bone aspect of this. That we are, the, we are from, I'm an equal part of both my father and my mother. And that's true with every one of us. Physically speaking. And even spiritually speaking. There's the light of God that passes through all of us in just plain and simply this place of life and the growth of life. So to curse our parents or to curse one another is basically severing this bond. That's why I connected it together with that bushel over the light, because that's exactly what that bushel over the light does is it severs the bond. It severs that place of saying, no, I don't have to listen to anybody. I don't have to deal with anybody. I can I can be the God of my own world and create my own world that if you walk into, it's up to me. How many people have you met? How many I, I can I can say the same thing myself. How many people have we met that 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 in hearing that story of what I'm telling you right now kind of makes it make it go, huh? Yeah, I've met a few people like that. And, and, but it, and it's done so overtly. Well, the truth is, is that we all have met people like that because to a certain extent, there's a part of us that in the place of us growing where we do tend to do that. We do tend to hide. We then do, do tend to put a bushel over, the, uh, over our light until Holy Spirit begins to reveal to us that place how that's not something that we want to do. We want the light of God to be able to shine through us. That's why, that's the reason why Hebrews says, therefore, brethren, we have a boldness to enter into an, uh, uh, the Holy of Holies by a new and living way. That is to say, his flesh. Now, I was talking about the flesh of Christ. But the truth is, is that that also is talking about my flesh as well. And I've often seen that place of where 
that, that there's this place of doing the Superman thing and pulling back my flesh and allowing the light being that Father has always made me to be, to be able to be released. We're not waiting for Holy Spirit to come down. Holy Spirit is crying to come out. Holy Spirit is trying, crying to come out of gear into the place of, of, of the temple of God that's already on the inside of us. And so when we start looking at the place of our mothers, our mother and father, we're looking at that in, in kind of the basic fundamental place of what gave us life in the first place. This place of where our parents, if you can go there with me, I, I said it just a moment ago, but I'm going to repeat it on purpose. Our parents in that place of where they, they came together as husband and wife and that a child was born, we are more like God in that place than any other time. Think about it. There's an intentionality that comes with the creation of a new life as a result of that. So if we begin to disregard our spiritual roots, our disregard the place of our parents, it begins to diminish our light because what we're doing is separating away from that light. And then it begins to speak, start speaking about the deep darkness. The deep darkness here, I wanted to kind of get into that because it, uh, it was something that jumped out to me with regards to this, especially as it applied towards other things that we've talked about before. And, uh, this deep darkness or the deepening darkness is what the uh, the Michelet calls it. The Hebrew word there for um, deepening is the Hebrew word be'ishon, uh, be'ishon. The root word of that is ishon. Now, ish is the Hebrew word for man. So it begins to talk about the place of, of really the literal interpretation of ishon is is the little man of the eye. The little man of the eye. So, just like what I've been just talking about, when I look at my parents, what I'm doing with them is reducing them within my own eye. I'm counting or regarding them as little or nothing. It goes on to that Ishon actually speaks about the pupil or the apple of the eye. Or something that is obscure as a part of, uh, of all of that. All of that's in with the, the Ishon. But remember when we talked about this probably about a month or so ago, and I talked about the Hebrew word kalal, which is one of the Hebrew words for curse, and it's to regard something as little or nothing. So the moment that I take and reduce my parents to something that is little or nothing, essentially what I'm doing is I'm cursing my own life as a result. Why? Because I've chosen to reduce them to obscurity, to why do I need to listen to them? Now, I hate to say it because I know we could argue this in great depth with regards to nowadays when sometimes, sometimes the parents of the children look at their children and count them as little or nothing. And we see the pain that comes from the other side of that. And I don't want to, I mean, I, I don't, well, maybe we can get into it in the, uh, in the engagement time, but I don't want to get into that right here in the, in the teaching time. So I'm, I'm, I'm honoring and looking at both perspectives of this, but it's painful and it causes pain to that child when the parents do this. How much more and how, how much more so on the other side will it be when we count our parents as little or nothing? Now, the Hebrew word for darkness there is actually the Hebrew word choshech. Now, I don't think I've talked about this much in this class, and I'm about ready to wrap this up. We have gone way over today. And so I appreciate those of you that are watching on YouTube and you're still here. Uh, but this is a very open class, and we love to be able to engage with one another, one another, even during the class itself. And so I don't want to stop that at all. But the koshech, the choshech, is the Hebrew word for darkness. Now, I've always seen choshech as not, as not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's actually speaking about a place of unrevealed light. In other words, there's a place of where Father has hidden his mysteries within the darkness. 
And just as the scripture tells us, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, to cover it over with darkness, if you will. And it's the glory of kings to search it out. So this word darkness and the fact that choshech was used here was intentional. Why? Because regardless of what this deepening, this deep part that it was talking about was, was in regards to, whether it's the parents regarding the children as little or nothing, or is the children regarding the parents as little or nothing, that the father says that if, you, if you're willing to see this, there is a treasure hidden on the inside of this. Look past this place of where, you know, where even the scripture tells us that can a mother forget her nursing children? Yea, they may forget, but the Lord says, I will never forget. He's hidden his, his treasure and his promises, even in that place of, of the darkness. And that he, he's, he's telling us, let's, we don't have to be affected by this. Let's, let's look into this place of what the, what the choshech has really hidden. The darkness is really hidden because there's a treasure hidden in there where Father can take us out of that place where we're not living the rest of our lives based on the fact of what other people have said about us. Go back to the previous verses that we were talking about earlier. Remember the, uh, what is it? The Verse 19, a revealer of secrets, a bearer of tales, or the simpleton of lips, do not mingle. That's exactly what we're talking about here. And that includes even from, even from family. That includes even from the way that we see things. Now, today has been very different, and I'm very thankful, Father, that you've taken us kind of taken us through this very practical way of looking at some things that that can be hard and, and difficult. Uh, but we, I, I bless you and thank you, Father, that we have the opportunity now. We can engage with this and we can dig into the heart behind this. But for those of you that are here, we, we do not do the engagement time on the recording. That's done afterwards because it's an open place where everyone can share and it's not being recorded. So we'd love for you to join us here in the class. Reach out to me. Our, the information is in the description below in the YouTube channel and you can, we can get you. The link for the class is already in there as well. And we'd love for you to join us in here. But Father, it is from this place that we speak over all those that are here today and all those that will be listening on YouTube. Ivarechacha Adonai Vishmarecha. Ye er Adonai Panavalecha vi Hunecha. Ye sa Adonai Panavalecha. Vi Simlecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face, his countenance, his presence towards you, and give you peace. Blessing, shalom. We love you guys, and we will see you next week.